not entirely sure how to get the presentation up. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Missed the first slide, but um, I'm a pediatric genetics nurse. I work in Tucson, Arizona, and I serve the Southern Arizona community. And um, I have no disclosures. That's the slide we missed. So, today I'm going to be talking about information that is related to EDS but also can be translated to any rare disease. So rare diseases affect more than a million people, so you're going to meet other people with EDS, but also other rare diseases. So some of the tools I'm gonna to be talking about today will translate into other parts of your life as well. And again, I'm talking mostly about families and children, but individuals with rare diseases, most of this information applies as well. You've heard a lot about this diagnostic odyssey. You heard a little bit about it this morning and the length of time some individuals are on this diagnostic odyssey. I'm sure there's people in this room that are still in the diagnostic odyssey. So I wanted to kind of just briefly touch on what this looks like for some people and um, how this can be different. So we understand what others have experienced, especially as healthcare providers. Um, when we have families that come to us so we can meet them where they're at. So a symptom usually starts. As a parent, this might be you watch your child playing on the playground and they don't look like their peers. Um, it could be delayed in some milestones. It could be your teenager that starts having some nonspecific symptoms. Usually most parents kind of wait and see, is this something that's going to resolve on its own? Is it going to get worse? Um, Usually this leads to a your first visit. It's usually a primary care doctor, pediatrician in the pediatric world. And um, that pediatrician might have the same approach. Let's wait and see. Let's see if something is going to get better. They might do some basic tests, imaging. Most of the time those results might be normal. So there's a little bit more waiting, usually no answers. Symptoms are usually getting worse. There might be suspected diagnosis, but you can't do anything because it hasn't been confirmed. There might be misdiagnoses. Eventually, you get referred to a specialist, and um, fortunately, and unfortunately in this country, it's usually quite a wait to get into a specialist. So during that time, again, it's more waiting, worsening symptoms. You might try a couple therapies here or there, um, that may or may not work, medications. And you finally get to see that specialist. May or may not help. <laughs> By the time you get to that specialist, you may have accumulated more symptoms, more things might be wrong. That specialist may have no idea how to help you or give you more answers. They might refer you to another specialist and you go in this circle again. When you finally make it to the right specialist that um, listens and tries to figure out what's going on. Um, they might do some further testing. This could be genetic testing. It could be a specific lab test. It could be a physical examination that hasn't been done previously. And this usually takes time. Um, if it's genetic testing, we might do a round of genetic testing. And then we need to clarify a vague result by testing family members. This can take months. And some people, even after all of this, wind up with no diagnosis. Um, and I want to stress that no diagnosis doesn't mean you have a rare disease. You do have a rare disease. If it was common, your primary care provider probably would have diagnosed it. So an undiagnosed rare disease is still a rare disease. We do not know about all rare diseases. But you hope at the end of this journey, you get an answer. So why do families go on this journey? And in the pediatric world, there's several questions that are running through parents' minds, even individuals, the kids. Why is this happening? Is it something I did? Is there something I could be do, doing to better take care of this? Is there an effective treatment that I don't know about? Um, what will the future hold? Is this gonna get worse with time? Is this 
something that's going to get better? Is this going to shorten my child's life? And will it happen again? We work with so many young families that have other children that are maybe affected um, or want to have more children. They're wondering, what are my chances of having another child that's affected? So this is what drives families on this diagnostic odyssey. When you finally get that rare diagnosis, you've heard what that means to an individual and a family. It gives you answers. It gives you a home. You find a community. You, you find that you're not alone. But there also comes, especially with children, a lot of parental guilt. This can be, could I have found this diagnosis faster? Um, did I cause this in my child? Did I give this to my child? Oh my goodness, I already have other children. Are they also affected? There's a huge part of this diagnosis that the parents kind of hold on to. And it's something that um, we're going to talk about some resources to help get families through this diagnosis. Um, but mo most of the time, it comes with some treatment initiation. This may or may not be a specific medication, but it can be augmentative therapies that can help support individuals. So at that first visit, I like to ensure that there's sufficient time when I'm diagnosing an individual. And that is face-to-face -face time with the family, but also time to prepare. There are thousands of rare conditions. So we need to make sure as healthcare providers we have enough knowledge to at least get the family through the first day of that diagnosis. So, and we also need to ensure there's time with the patients. That's a struggle here in this country. I'm sure most of you know that we don't have a lot of time with our patients, and sometimes our patients suffer from it. Rare diseases, you just heard, educational materials are often sparse. So I can't tell you how many times I'm walking into a family's room with a single scientific article that talks about their rare disease, or a printout of a Facebook page of a family group because that's all that exists for their condition. Um, but social media has allowed this ability to network. So we're, in the past, you know, you were told you're the 10th person in the world diagnosed with this. Well, now you can actually find the other nine people in the world and connect with them and expand the diagnosis. Um, these groups don't exist for many of the diagnoses we hand out, so we actually encourage families to start them. Um, this is where research, is, um, research ideas are generated and a lot of funding for research is generated. We also make sure we have resources available to support the grief process. We often think about grief as associated with the loss of a loved one, someone leaving this life, but grief is the loss of anything. So families, when they're first given a diagnosis, as I'm sure most of you know, it's grieving the loss of a life as you thought it would be. It's grieving the idea that your child might be independent as an adult. And it could be grieving a chronic diagnosis. So there are usually local resources. We have a wonderful organization in Tucson called Tunidito, where families can come together and work through this grieving process together and um, have access to resources as they do this. And clinicaltrials.gov. I can't say enough about research because um, as we're discovering more and more diseases, it's important to um, participate in research. And that's the only way we're going to expand treatment options and um, understand diseases. So clinicaltrials.gov is a repository of clinical studies. So if you've ever gone into this website as a um, healthcare provider, I go in here often, um, you'll get information about the status of a study, maybe primary endpoints, what is that study looking to achieve? Are they testing a drug? Are they, um, where are they located? This is an international repository. Um, and you'll find contact information for the individuals that are um, conducting the study. Registries are in here. So you'll see here that I just typed in Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and you'll see the registry right there. I can't give um, enough of a plug for registries. Again, 
not only does it help us expand the disease, understand what others, um, everyone that's affected is experiencing. You know, if we define diseases by the first 10 people that were diagnosed by, with the disease, we'd be missing a ton of information. So repos uh, registries allow us to expand those diagnoses. And um, it's usually the first stop for recruitment for other clinical studies that might come available. So being in a registry, it kind of gives you first dibs on new studies. So I'd encourage everyone to participate in registries for their specific condition. If it doesn't exist, consider starting one. Yeah. And then long-term follow-up. Um, I'm lucky, in pediatric genetics, we get to follow our patients regularly. We want to. And that follow-up can look different depending on what's going on in your life. So if you're one of those undiagnosed rare disease patients, it gives us an opportunity to reevaluate you. Are there new symptoms, new clues that might lead us down the right path? Um, is there a new technology that we could use to find a diagnosis? Um, and also new man management guidelines. You've been hearing about updating guidelines, developing new guidelines. So we want to make sure that the, the, um, our patients are getting the most evidence-based and updated care. I've learned from you all. <laughs> so I now walk into rooms mostly and ask, what do you need from me today? Because if I walked in with my own agenda, you know, oh, I need to teach them about this or I need to tell them about these new guidelines, I might miss what they actually need that day. And I'm always surprised by patients. Um, you know, that first visit when I walk in, I'm the expert in the room. I'm not really an expert, but I maybe know more than most people in the room. But by the time that family's following up with me, they're going to be able to teach me. Most of the time, they've done their due diligence. They know what's going on. They have a good handle on their condition and their disease. So I listen. They're going to teach me. And I can step in where they need support. Do they need a referral that's missing from their primary care provider? Um, do they want to talk about a new treatment? a new scientific article that came out. Just try to meet them where they're at. And again, always encouraging research participation. So that clinicaltrials.gov isn't just for the first visit. I'll go back to that for every subsequent visit. And encourage the families to use support. When we diagnose children, can't tell you how many times during that visit it becomes apparent that the parent is also affected and had no idea. Maybe they're more mildly affected or differently affected. And so giving a diagnosis to a child can trickle back into the, the family, parents, um, other children, for their distant relatives. So I tell my parents all the time, and if there's parents in the audience, if you don't take care of yourself, you won't be able to take care of your children. So prioritize your own self-care. I know that's way easier said than done. I'm a parent myself. But utilize your resources. Have a list. This list will be invaluable. It's your, your help list. When somebody says, can I help you out with something? Do you need something? Go to that list. Don't say, oh, I'm fine. I'm good. Other people can step in and help. And it might be something simple like make a meal. You know, we hear about a lot of people getting a new diagnosis and the support is immediate and immense for a lot of families, but then it trickles off, especially in chronic diagnoses. So when your friends or family check in, what do you need? Have something to give them, because you need care too. Um, utilize respite care when it's available, um, and financial support. So many families that were maybe financially secure before a diagnosis or before you had a child with a chronic illness lose that financial security. They no longer have financial means. This might mean a parent has to leave a, a profession um, because of the time commitment to get their child to all of their healthcare appointments or therapy appointments. Sometimes insurance costs are high, so coinsurance or deductibles, um, especially in this country, can really put a burden on the family that doesn't exist for other families with healthy children. So, Resources. I, I'm just putting up um, something to remind me about broader categories of resources. So insurance companies. 
every insurance company, I know insurance isn't unique or um, isn't applicable to every country, but insurance companies usually have foundations where they can step in and help with out-of-pocket expenses like co-pays or out-of-network provider visits, um, larger healthcare organizations like Banner, Kaiser Permanente, these all have um, foundations that also you can apply for grants and get assistance with medical support uh, or medical costs. There are organizations that are disease specific, as you all know about the EDS Societies Foundation, um, that you can also apply for grants just to help with uh, assuage those medical costs. Prescription. If you find a medication that works and your insurance doesn't cover it, it costs a ton, just know that there are tons of um, prescription help programs that are autonomous and also a part of the drug companies. So go to the drug company that makes the drug that's working for you and ask them for support. All of them have these foundations. It doesn't need to be a burden on you. And there are also the crowdfunding sources. So we've all heard of GoFundMe and these other two in the corner, the CoFund Health and Help Hope Live or other platforms to allow for fundraising for medical costs. Unfortunately, we do have to deal with the high cost of medical care, at least in this country. And the last piece I wanted to talk about is transition. So as you can see, this is one center the number of individuals they've been transitioning from childhood into adulthood over a 10-year span, the number of individuals with rare diseases has tripled. And we know that. We know about more rare diseases. So now we're diagnosing them. So are we successfully transitioning our kids? What can we do to support that transition process? So I like to, as early as a child is able to understand um, I try to address them first in the visit. And I ask them things like, why are you here? Inevitably, they tell me something like, uh, it's a checkup. I'm here to see the doctor. And I want, I want them to say, well, are you diagnosed with a condition? I want them to start owning their own healthcare, owning their diagnosis and understanding it. As they get older, we start, I do pop quizzes. I tell them, I warn them. <laughs> um, you know, if you, as you, as you get older, if you decide to have children of your own, what are the chances you're going to pass this on to your child, this condition? And I want them to be able to tell me, and we talk through it. Um, start well before adulthood. So as parents, um, we take care of our child's health care needs. We schedule their appointments. We deal with the insurance, which is a nightmare. Um, we have to appeal decisions that are inappropriate by the insurance company. We have to navigate that process and our, our, our children see us do that and they're just thinking it's frustrating. Well, let's give them the knowledge we've learned navigating this process and ensure that they have the tools to do this as they get older. Start well before they turn 18. As soon as they're able, start having them make their own appointments, understanding why the appointments are being made. Allow them to participate in the decision-making of their own health. Again, easier said than done. Um, there are several programs available, um, both online and usually within clinics, that will help families give you some practical tools to help this transition process. And so let's empower the patient. And I want to end by saying most of our children with rare diseases will become adults with rare diseases. So this transition is important. Thank you for listening.